I just want to do God's will. The kind of revolution that the world needs is a Christian revolution. If you want a miracle, you've got to expect it to happen. You are the recipients of God's grace and God's blessings, and you rejoice in that reality. Welcome to Life Today Live. Hope you had a good weekend. Good to have you here on this Monday. Uh, I'm curious, if you're a Christian, you've been in church, maybe like me, you've been a Christian basically your whole life. Do you ever hear somebody say something about Christianity or about the church and go, no, 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 that's, that's, that's not it at all. And then maybe you hear somebody say, say something negative about the church or Christianity and you go, yeah, okay, I can see where you got that. <laughs> but let me, let, let me straighten that out for you. Let's be honest. Sometimes Christianity has a bit of an image problem. Now, I, do not mishear me. I'm not saying that Christ has a problem at all. I'm talking about us followers. Uh, and that's why I love to say God never said that we were to be like Christians. He said we were to be like Christ. <laughs> He's the only perfect example. But at the same time, I think we have a responsibility as followers to represent Christ well. How do we do that? Well, today we're going to talk about maybe some changes we could make in the church, maybe some things we've missed, maybe some things we're doing right uh, that, that give Christianity and the the church, the, the followers of Christ, um, you know, some things we could do better. Uh, we have a book out now. It's called Rebranding Christianity. Uh, it's by Jeff Jones. He's a pastor. Uh, he's also host of a podcast called The Good Complex and a Rebranding Christianity podcast as well. Uh, and he's going to join us. He's here right now to talk about uh, maybe some of the image issues that we have in church. And let's be honest, it's better for us to call them out as believers than to wait on the world to criticize us. So we're going to we're going to do that with a spirit of um, improvement, if that's a, such a thing. We're going to exhibit that today, I hope. Great to have you here. If you're watching live, chat is open. You're invited to be a part of the conversation. Pastor Jeff Jones, great to have you here on Life Today Live. Thanks so much, Randy. I really appreciate it. So I'm I'm curious how this started with you as a pastor, as, as yeah. uh, you know, graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. Did, did you have some things about the church you didn't like, or did you merely have some people saying things and you're like, why would they think that about us? Where, where did this come from? Yeah. Well, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so mm. that's part of it. Mm. Uh, my family became Christians through online church. Uh, my dad and my brother are in heaven now because of that, so mm. I'm thankful. Mm. And we're a church built around people who don't go to church. And so what I started to see is, as we're trying to reach the people we're reaching, that uh, the perception of Christianity was sinking so low that we couldn't really start with evangelism. It was kind of pre-evangelism, you know, because we were, we become repulsive. And, you know, when I started ministry, really, it was people who were pretty positive about Christianity in church. This was 30 years ago. Um, it just seemed Christianity seemed irrelevant. Um, but increasingly, people outside of Christianity find us repulsive, hmm. and and that's a whole other that's a whole other animal and a whole other way to do do ministry and and especially in the emerging generations. And so as I saw that, just said, man, this is happening on my watch as a pastor, and <laughs> I've got to do whatever I can to do something about it. All right, well, what is it that, that they don't like about the church? Yeah, you know, it's. Um, it, it, you know, when you when you talk to when you when you look at people, especially in emerging generations like Generation Z, you know, which is the youngest generation of adults, uh, it's not pretty, you know, and um, and the way they'll describe Christians. But you know, Gallup did a study back in two thousand one, where they asked people in that young adult age group how many had a positive view of Christianity, and in, in just twenty years ago, that was sixty percent had a positive view, whether they were Christians or not. They just repeated that study 20 years later, and only 37% of people in that generation today um, have a positive view of Christianity, which means 63% believe we're a negative force in the world, not a positive force. And these are our kids, mm. you know, these are young adults. And, you know, when when they're asked the words that they use to describe Christianity are words like arrogant, mean, pushy, bigoted, you know, all those things. And 
And so it, it it's a massive shift that's happened in my lifetime. I mean, I, I think in my lifetime, I've seen Christianity go from being admired uh, to being kind of tolerated uh, to being maybe canceled <laughs> and now seen as repulsive. And it's jarring, you know, especially again in the emerging generations. And um, so I think the faith of the next generation is at stake. Yeah, I think it's fair to ask, uh, do they have this perception because a lot of Christians are arrogant and mean, or do they have this perception because the world is lying about us? Yeah, that's a, such a great question. And and I think both are true. Hmm. You know, I, I certainly media and Hollywood and all of that. I mean, I'm a pastor. So whenever I see, if, if I'm watching a movie or a TV show and a pastor comes on as a character, I always think, oh boy, here we go. You know, exactly. this is not going to be good. They're going to, they're going to be, you know, legalistic or mean or, oh. you know, a pedophile or who knows what they're going to be, but it's not going to be good, you know? And, and so they go, oh, here we go, you know? And so sure. Some of that is unfair. And yet I think if we were living as, as Jesus taught us to live, you know, he gave us the brand and we can talk about what the brand is in a little bit, but if we're not known the way he told us to be known, I don't think he gives us the option just to blame everybody else. Mm -hmm. I think that's on us, you know, and, and I really think if we were living up the brand, even movies or whatever, when that kind of thing happened, people would be kind of like, well, that's not true. Yeah, that's stupid. I, I pastors aren't like that. Christians aren't like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's not what happens, you know? And so I think there's a perception problem for sure caused by people who don't like us, but there's also a reality problem. We give them plenty of stuff to work with, yeah. that um, you know, I, unfortunately. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, and that that that's that's a tough one. I mean, I don't disagree with you, but at the same time, you know, you remember the Westboro Baptist Church oh, yeah. from, from a while yeah. back, um, yeah. and the Baptists had totally dissociated themselves and thrown them out and said, "You're not, you know, you're not even." Uh, but yet you saw the media always going back to the, oh, like this is what the church looks like, and, and I think every Christian's sitting at home going stop you're lying you know um at the same time there i think part of the issue and and uh, correct me if i'm wrong because you, you wrote the book is is that the fewer people out there representing christ means that there are fewer contacts uh with the world and and sometimes we get real insulated you know we we go oh well we don't want to hang around those sinners you know and so a lot of people, I think, outside the church really don't know any Christians. Does does that play into it? I think it does, you know, and it's, it's you know, right now there's, you know, our, our world is, is a, it's kind of a scary world in some ways, right? And, mm -hmm. and you, and as a Christian, you look at the world sort of cycling away from Christianity and, and it can create fear. And I believe when Christians are animated by fear, it makes us make some really big mistakes. And one of those is what you're talking about. You know, just like in high school biology, right? When you're, when fear happens, it's either fight or flight, mm -hmm. right? So either you go into flight mode where, yeah, we just bubble up with people who think just like us and aren't really engaged in the world. So you're right. People, uh, you know, we're so insulated and especially in such a polarized culture in which mm -hmm. we live now. Mm -hmm we can contribute to that. And then the other is fight where we go into fight mode and uh, enter into culture wars and all that kind of thing yeah. and try to impose our point of view as the point of view. And it turns out that people we're called to reach don't appreciate it when we go into warfare mode, when we make them the enemy, you yeah, know, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. they don't feel the love. And that's happened a lot. And and I think by well-meaning Christians, right, who who really want to stand for truth, so to speak, and that kind of thing. But um, but lose, you know, the New Testament talks so much about how to engage culture with our truth, but engage culture in a compelling way, in an endearing way, as opposed to a warfare way. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's one of the big contributing factors is just the fear and and that causes either fight or flight and and pushes people away mm -hmm. rather than draws people. Yeah. One, one more thing I want to ask you about before we get to what the brand should be. Uh, and, and that is, you know, my dad was very instrumental in the early formation of what we now look back on and call the religious right. Uh, and yeah. he hated that term. And as he yeah. saw it getting hyper-political, he actually 
distance himself from a lot of the leaders of, of that movement. And I'm talking about in the eighties, yeah. you know, into the nineties. And I, I am uh, 100% convinced that Christians should engage the culture, which means engaging politics as well. And yeah. I'm a hundred percent convinced that we need to, to stand, you know, I'm not going to move on the issue of, of a life of abortion and saying that sure. abortion is wrong. It's how you say it. Uh, a lot of yeah. times more than what you say, but has the, I also have seen, I mean, I see this still today, Christians putting uh, too much stock in an election and, and, and hope for the future in oh, a yeah. political race um, as opposed, and, and uh, they won't say this, they won't say that the gospel is not the solution, but it's it's like if you took if you measured the amount of time they they spent talking about you know a, the politics of it and the time they spent talking about the gospel you you might go maybe we should reassess that so my question would be has some of the political activism as well intentioned and sometimes as proper as as it should be hurt us in the long run yeah no doubt you know i think one of the biggest one of the biggest mission drifts in the church has been <laughs> politicizing Christianity yeah. and politicizing the church yeah. and choosing a side and aligning so much with that side that we demonize the other side. Yeah. And, um, and it's interesting because I, you know, as I'm doing, as I'm writing the book, I'm interacting with, you know, I'm from the South, I'm from Alabama and I live in Dallas, pastor in Dallas. But when I interact with people in the Northeast and Northwest, it's so different because they're, you know, they would, they, they align with the progressives, you know, with the left as Christians, right. you know, and, and for me, it's like, really, you know, it's just hard to, <laughs> right. but they can't understand how somebody could be, could align right and be a Christian. Right. And so, and people who are right could not possibly understand why people could align left and, and be, and, and attach Christianity to that, which should tell us something. It, it should tell us that, that our identity is, is above all of that. Like, you know, the thing that unites us should not be our, our political, we should be, we, I mean, we should have political opinions and I'm engaged politically and glad I am, but that's not what unites the church. And that's not what should define the church. And, you know, that, that gets into, I think the weapons of the warfare of this world, you know, that uh, can actually cause a lot of backlash unnecessarily from the hope, the real hope, which is the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's tough. I get it because you know, your political support uh, and, and, and positions should be a reflection of the gospel, you know, not the direction of the gospel. But, and, and so you, sometimes you go, I, 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 well, just as an example, I already mentioned, I, I don't understand how someone who can call, can call themselves a Christian and support what I believe is, is, you know, murdering babies. Now, how do you go about having that conversation without just demonizing the other side? That's, that's, I think where the nuances are. And I do think it's possible. So, all right, this is the book again, uh, rebranding Christianity, a couple of websites that I want to show you real quick. But one of them is for the book. Uh, this well, actually, this is the good uh, where you can see, you hear the podcast and see some other information. And then the rebranding Christianity.org book website looks just like that so if you want to follow up now you know what it looks like uh if you're out there looking for it but but let me ask you uh jeff what should be the brand to use a wonderful marketing term of yeah. christianity yeah you know it in in the title you know it's designed to be a little provocative to get us thinking you know rebranding christianity because it can sound like what we're saying is say hey, this two thousand year old brand People are rejecting and it's not working anymore. So we've got to go back to the drawing board, get a bunch of marketing experts and <laughs> come up with something new. Because the way Jesus did it, you know, that, that worked 2,000 years ago, but we got to do something new. It's actually the opposite of that. It's actually saying, let's go back 2,000 years mm. to the brand as Jesus gave it. Because he said, this is how you'll be known. This is how pe This is how we roll, you know. And that goes all the way back to, I, I, you can see it in the Sermon on the Mount and other places, but I think that, 
the new command in the in the Last Supper conversation in John 13 is maybe the clearest, where he said this, you know, I'm giving you a new command, love one another as I've loved you, you should love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my followers if you love one another. And the new command, how we should be known as his followers, is to love the way he loved. And that's what makes it new. That's what makes it significant, right? Mm-hmm. Is It's Jesus level love. Uh, the way that they, the disciples had seen him love for those four years. And then John 15, he returns to the conversation and he says, there's no greater love than this. When a man lays down his life for his friends, the next day they would see him do that on the cross. Mm-hmm. So the first thing people should think of when they think of, if they're not a Christian and they hear about a Christian, let's say a Christian moves next door. Is to think, oh man, we got so lucky. These are amazing people. I mean, who else is that loving? Yeah. Who else is that forgiving? Who else is that sacrificial? Who else is that generous? I mean, we're talking Jesus level love. And in the early church did that. I mean, that's you know, one of the amazing questions in, in history is how did Christianity survive? Uh, because it really shouldn't have. I mean, we know about God, but from a pure historical, it, it really shouldn't have. Is this malign, tiny little group of people uh, and uh, that the Jews hated at the time, the Jewish, you know, Jewish uh, people hated the in in Judea, and the Romans, you know, persecuted. So how did they not only survive but become the dominant force in in the Western world, literally take over the empire? And what's really cool about that is. You know, secular historians, not just Christian historians, as they look at that question of history, realize really uh, the reason it happened is these Christians displayed love in a way that the world had never seen. Mm -hmm. And the way they formed communities, diverse communities, and the way that love spilled over to the needy and to the, that they literally won over a skeptical and hostile world the way Jesus told us to. And, And I think that's where we're at again. At the same time, I think it's fair to point out that, um, you know, Jesus warned his disciples that they would have, you know, trials, tribulations in the world, and they certainly did. Obviously, the Roman yeah. culture was very anti-Christian, and the, and the Judaizers were, were set against them, too, so there was a lot of historical things going on there. But at, it, I think there is also a truth in that when we do this, what you're talking about, I mean, there is an element of the world that's gonna hate us. And I think that's where a lot of Christians get tripped up, where we show the love of Christ and people hate us back, and then what? And the then what often kicks into the isolation, um, the anger, the condemnation. And I really think that's where that's where the real test is, is when you show love like Jesus did and they wanna crucify you for it, how do you respond? Is that, do you think, is that fair? Yeah, you know, I, there's two thoughts there. One is I love how Peter and, you know, first Peter writing to Christians in Rome who were being persecuted, I mean, right in the heart of the Roman empire in the region of Rome. And he says, Hey, look, if you, if you're persecuted, if you're mistreated because you are doing what Christ called us to do and being who he calls us to be, well, you know what, that's okay. Um, you'll be rewarded for all eternity for mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. And if you're mistreated and persecuted because you're not who I've called you to be, that's on you. <laughs> and so let's make sure if we're mistreated, we're mistreated for the right reasons. You know? <laughs> right, right. And then the way the early Christians thought, it's just so different. And I've been among persecuted Christians in different parts of the world. I'm, I'm sure you have too. Yeah. And it's such a different perspective because to them, to the early Christians, they saw when when they were persecuted and mistreated, they saw it as an opportunity for the gospel because right. it was love enemies, you right, know, and, right. and Jesus was the only one, first one who ever talked about loving your enemies, you know, and, and they did. And so these, and that's what Roman, that's what historians, you know, look at as, as one of the most profound reasons that Christianity became so attractive is that um, when Christians were persecuted, I mean, they saw Christians praying for their persecutors as they were about to be lit on fire, covered in tar, lit on fire uh, to light these garden parties in Nero. Mm. And these Christians are praying for the person that's about to light them on fire. Yeah, Because that's what Jesus told us to do, to love, to pray, to do good. Um, in the Colosseums, same thing, you know, as these Christians were being 
killed and persecuted. They were praying for their persecutors. And, and the populace after a while looked at that and said, what, what are we doing? Yeah. You know? And, uh, and they, you know, they were hated by the leadership because love is subversive. Christianity is a very subversive religion to power structures, but they won over the populace. I, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, you look at what Hamas did in, in Israel and how just evil and awful it is. I, I, I think my first instinct would be to shoot back. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, I and, and, and for yeah. I pray to God we're never in that position. Uh, but yet you're also right. I've talked to people in other countries where becoming a Christian is a danger to their own lives. And I think God gives us the grace for the situation we're in if we will just uh, cling to that. But it is an interesting paradigm shift, um, you know, when you when you talk about actual persecution. Yeah. And I, I remember years ago in the in the Iron Curtain days, you know, before communism fell, mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. Christians in Russia and Ukraine and um, Romania, who some of whom were deeply persecuted and, and all that. And, and I remember being in a prayer meeting in one of those countries, and they were praying for the privilege of martyrdom and to fill up the sufferings of Christ and to display the love of Christ to their mm -hmm. enemy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I wanted to kind of pull out of the little prayer strut, you know, like I got, I don't want that <laughs> right. I mean, praying for that, but I don't, you know, don't include me in this, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, and I'm kind of joking, but, uh, but it's just a different mentality, you know? Yeah. Oh, I'm not joking. Christ died for our sins. I don't need to, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, right, that's, right. so, okay. There's one other thing you addressed in the book that I want to ask you about, because this is a, this is a difficult one for me sometimes to kind of parse out because, you know, um, I mean, we've had some people from uh, Bethel uh, at California uh, Church yeah. on and, and uh, the music that this, I, mean, I love their music. I mean, some of the theology I don't necessarily agree with, but the, uh, the, the music and wonderful people I've, that I've met, you know, from there, Kim Walker Smith, Chris K. Lyle, a bunch of those really fine Jesus loving people, right? And they're lighting their their cities on fire for Christ. Um, Hillsong, same kind of thing. I love the music coming out of there. And we've seen some really whacked out things, you know, in some of the Hillsong churches, unfortunately. Um, but yet a lot of people have come to Christ. So I, you kind of get this mixed thing. I I wonder about the almost commercialization of Christianity, you know? Um, I love Air One and some of the radio stations. But, but it's some you you go are, are we going too far? How how do we where do we know <laughs> when we're when business and Christianity become the lines become a little blurred? Where's where's the right place to land? Yeah, well, that's a great question, right? Because we you know I, I lead a church, right, and it's a large church, and we have a we have a limited budget, we have a couple hundred staff people, we have a really important mission. So I want to learn all I can about how to run an organization with the most important mission in the world with resources that people have given to glory of God yeah. um, as, as excellent as possible. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and so everything I can learn from, you know, business and all that I, I'll learn. Right. But, um, but at the same time, um, realizing, Hey, ultimately uh, we're really not, that, that we yeah, we can learn lots of things from business and all of that, but ultimately we're, this is a Jesus movement of radical love on this planet. Um, not so much an organization as it is a movement, and and we can't lose our identity, and uh, and let the kind of the corporate structure or even corporate learnings kind of become who we are. Mm. Uh, we can learn from them, but but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm a mega church pastor. People call me. Right. So, and that's scary word. Um, and you can easily become too, um, corporate if you're not careful, but at the same time, I want to, I want to be the best run organization I can possibly be. So there's a tension there. That yeah. I think so. yeah. All right. Well, I have to pick up the book to, to delve into that. Oh, okay. I have a little quiz for you. All right. Yeah. Finish, finish this statement. For there are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's say that again. So there's some things money can't buy. But for everything else, there's 
Do you know that slogan? No. Uh -uh. Okay, that, that's MasterCard. I'll give you an easier one. Just, oh, okay. Sorry about that. Ju just yeah. do it, right? Everybody knows yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, Mikey, yeah. Uh, the happiest place on earth. Don't know. <laughs> You're too much of a pastor. Uh, that's Disneyland. <laughs> no. Okay, well, that makes sense. Well, yeah. that's an old slogan. That's the gayest place on earth. I mean, I don't know. okay. No, <laughs> well, I'm getting off track. Um, how about uh, you're in good hands with? With Allstate. There yeah. you go. Uh, let's see. Another one. Um, uh, well, how about, uh, do you know the, the cereal uh, that's uh, Snap, Crackle, and Pop, right? Yeah, yeah. Rice Krispies. Right. So I'm um, playing this little ridiculous game because if you were to write a slogan for Christianity, have you thought about this? Because this is not in my notes. I'm going off script here yeah. totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would the slogan of Christianity be? Yeah, you know, I, that's a great question. I, I think, um, I don't know how to sloganize it, but I think I do from John 13. You know, it's love the way I've loved. It's uh, it's we're the people of radical love, of over-the-top love. And if we're not known that way, then it's on us because we're told this is the way you'll be known. Like, this is it. This is all I'm asking you to do. He didn't say, this is how people know you're my disciples if you're more right than everybody else and let them know it. He didn't say that. Even though we have truth, you know, and, and we have things that are right to share. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things he didn't say, but what he said was, this is how people know you're my disciples. If you love the way I love you, that's the way you'll be known. I love it. I, I think we just came up with a slogan for the church, radical love. How's that? I'm all for it. <laughs> all right. That's Pastor Jeff Jones. This is the book, Rebranding Christianity, available where you pick up books. Uh Appreciate you. Thank you for taking the time to share. Is there anything else you want to mention before I let you go? Well, thanks, Randy. You know, it's been interesting, you know, pray for this. The thing I didn't, I, I, you know, I wrote the book for Christians, but it's been really interesting because the most feedback I've gotten is from either non-Christians or younger people who are exiting the church yeah. and it's giving hope or curiosity just that somebody's willing to say, hey, you know what? We're not who we're supposed to be. Hmm. We're going to be honest about that. And uh, it's kind of like people, the way one person said is, hey, I know you stink. I didn't know you know you stink and are willing to do <laughs> something about it. And uh, I was like, well, that's really interesting. So so please pray about that, you know, and as as these as books have gotten into the hands of certainly young people who are departing from church and it's giving them some hope, but also non-Christians. It's just it's just really fascinating how God how God works and uses things. Well, on the uh, marquee of Chase Oaks Church over in Dallas, I, I expect to see soon the letters that say, we stink too. All right. No, yeah. it's, it's been fun. Again, thank you. I appreciate you. Appreciate Thanks, you guys man. watching, hanging out with us a little bit. And this is something to think about. I think it's good. Radical love. I like that one. Appreciate you guys being here. This is rebrandingchristianity.org, the website. You can pick up the book wherever you get books. We'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live. In spite of our rebellion, in spite of our sins, in spite of our failures, God says, I love you. I love you.